A very good afternoon to everyone who is listening. My name is Dr. Ali and I'm the physician from uh, Hospital Telo Intam Medical Department. Today, my topic is about fluid management in dengue patients. Uh, so why am I going to talk about this topic? Because fluid management in dengue patients, first of all, is one of the most common pitfalls in our management of dengue, which leads to morbidity and mortality. And also because this is the topic given to me. We start off with epidemiology. In, in 2019, Malaysia recorded the highest number of dengue fever, dengue cases in four years at over 130,000, rising 61% from 2018. As you can see from this graph, the red line represents the cases in 2019 and the blue line represents the cases in 2018. And you can see that there is a 61% increase in the total number of cases. However, the number of deaths was 182 for 2019 as compared to 336 deaths in 2015. So even though the cases are higher compared to the previous years, the number of deaths have reduced. And now we look at the weekly epidemiology study in Malaysia. So this one is according to during week 36 in 2020. There is a total of 1,479 dengue cases that have been re reported. So uh, this, the total cases, in conclusion, the total cases for this week is less as compared of, to the total cases of this week, week 36 in 2019 of last year. Two dengue deaths were reported in week 36, with a cumulative figure of 118 deaths in 2020 as compared to 137 deaths during the same period in 2019. So the cases, the number of cases of dengue has reduced and, and also the number of mortality cases has reduced. So this is the dengue assessment checklist where we have in all our hospitals. So it includes the symptoms, the warning signs, which we have to pay our attention to, and also uh, criteria for admission as a special group of uh, patients that we need to pay attention. And most importantly is the chart here. We need to detect severe dengue and at early stage and not to risk it. So here, uh, these are the symptoms, fever, body aches and pain, okay, acharja myogia, nausea vomiting, rashes. And this one, leukopedia will be seen in a full blood count and ask patient whether there's any warning signs. So what are the warning signs? So we should memorize all these warning signs. We know it, should know it at the back of our heart, head. So it should be persistent vomiting and diarrhea more than three times over the last 24 hours. Any abdominal pain or tenderness. Any CNS involvement, for example, lethargy, restlessness, confusion, which usually occur in the late stage. Tender hepatomegaly. Third space fluid accumulation, which is our plasma leakage. Spontaneous bleeding tendencies and raised hematocrit with rapid drop in platelet. So there's a guide here uh, regarding the hematocrit. In male less than 60 years old, hematocrit, if it's more than 46, it is considered raised. And in male more than 60 years old, hematocrit more than 42 is the cutoff point. Female of all ages, hematocrit more than 40 is the cutoff point. So there are other criteria for admission, for example, syncope. Diarrhea and also social factor, for example, patients staying far away and has transportation problem. Other special group that we need to take note and and uh, if they come to you with dengue fever, they need to be admitted. For example, obese, obese patients, pregnant ladies, patients with comorbid like heart failure, chronic kidney disease and chronic lung disease, diabetic patient, hypertensive patient, patient with IHD, COPD and elderly patient of more than 65 years old. So here we can write down the laboratory uh, result, full blood count result, and here are the vital sign. Okay, for severe dengue, we need to document whether there's any uh, low blood pressure or systolic blood pressure less than 90, and maybe less than 60, or there is a systolic blood, blood pressure drop of more than 40 from known baseline. Okay, also pay attention to shock index. Shock index is when the heart rate is more than the systolic blood pressure or if there is any impact profusion. Third, we need to make, uh, look out for any third space fluid regulation with respiratory distress, for example, pleural effusion 
and ascites. Another one is disturbed conscious level. And last one is any bleeding tendency, for example, any upper GI bleed, any non mucosal and non cutaneous bleed. And also, specific organ dysfunction, for example, our acute kidney injury or our acute hepatitis. So, we need to document also the date and time of fever onset, the exact date, and when the, and the critical phase onset. It's very important to note the day and the time of the critical phase onset because critical phase only lasts 48 hours and we need to calculate exactly uh, 48 hours to know how to manage patient properly. So it's being divided into three phases, the febrile phase, critical phase, which lasts 48 hours, and after that, the recovery phase. Okay, these are the common pitfalls in dengue mortality. First is delay in dengue diagnosis because there are uh, many presentations that are similar to dengue, which can come in the form of any viral fever. And number two, there's uh, inability to detect severe dengue, for example, when patient is in shock, especially in the stage of compensated shock. Third is suboptimal fluid management. That means sometimes we give too little fluid, sometimes we give too much fluid, and sometimes we don't give fluid when we should give, or sometimes we give fluid when we shouldn't give. Next is inadequate monitoring. So uh, when we have dengue patients, especially in the critical phase, we need adequate and more frequent monitoring and assessment. Last is delay in seeking ICU care. So today I'll focus on fluid therapy. In all cases, non-shock dengue patients who can tolerate orally, we would encourage oral fluid intake of two to three liters per day. If they can eat, if they can drink, they have no warning sign, you can encourage them to just take orally. And you, in this case, in that cases, you do not need IV drip. So when do you need IV drip? You will only need IV drip if there is increasing hematocrit with evidence of ongoing plasma leakage, despite patient has increased oral intake. That means patient is already taking two to three liters per day, but the hematocrit is still increasing in trend. And there's evidence of ongoing plasma leakage, then there is an indication to start IV drip. Another one is patient who cannot take orally. So in patient who cannot take orally, you have to start IV drip. For example, patient who are vomiting, having severe diarrhea, poor appetite, cannot tolerate orally. So when we start IV drip, how should we start this IV drip? So we need to start with, we can start with uh, our maintenance uh, regime. For non-obese patients, usually we can give 1.2 to 1.5 mil per kg per hour. So this is very important. Their weight is very important. Hence, every patient, every dengue patient that is admitted to what they need to be weighed weigh with our weighing scale and, and their weight calculated according to it. And, and their, the fluid and management, fluid requirement will be calculated according to their weight. However, please note this, if patient is overweight or obese, if BMI specific, clearly BMI more than 27.5 kg per meter square, then the maintenance fluid, we cannot just use this formula. We need to use the adjusted body weight to calculate the maintenance fluid. So in the past, we used ideal body weight, but now, according to the latest CPG, we need to use adjusted body weight. So adjusted body weight has already included the ideal body weight in the formula. So this is the uh, adjusted, body, uh, adjusted body weight formula and based on the ideal body weight for female and male, which is different. So when we start uh, IV drip maintenance, we must always monitor patient's fluid intake and the IV drip that we give and also urate output. So we have to calculate patient's fluid intake plus the IV drip and also have to calculate the urine output. It must be reviewed and adjusted according to clinical response. Hence, the use of volumetric pump is encouraged, especially in patients requiring close fluid monitoring. Okay, for example, dengue infection in day four with vomiting and poor orientation. Patient came in day three, hematocrit 40, and day four hematocrit has increased to 42. Temperature 38 degrees. Patient's body weight is 50 kg. He has poor orientate, minimum of 500 cc per day. In this case, we want to give this patient full maintenance of 1.5 mils per kg per hour. 
So one point few, one point mu, one point five mu times 80, fifty kilogram is uh, seventy five cc per hour. So seventy five cc you need to type twenty four hours per day because we have to calculate to how much fluid we have to give in a day. So seventy five times twenty four is one thousand eight hundred. So to total of uh one patient needs a total of one thousand eight hundred cc per day. So, but he can take 500 cc per day. Hence, we use this 1,800 to minus 500 cc uh, to get 1,300 cc per day. Okay, so roughly, he, he can get, he, you can give him the fluid infusion of 1,300 or to 1,500 500 cc per day. So be, the caution here is often the maintenance fluid will be required during critical phase. Okay, in early, early, in early phase, the, the fur brown phase, most of uh, most of the time, if you don't give maintenance fluid, a patient doesn't have uh, it's still okay because plasma leakage usually occurs in the critical phase. So in critical phase, then you need to consider maintenance fluid, especially if patient cannot take orally, have warning sign or have in, uh, evidence of plasma leakage increasing hematocrit. Frequent adjustment of maintenance fluid regime is needed during critical phase. Okay, when you give patient IV drip, you need to continue to monitor patients orientate because after giving a few hours of IV drip, probably patients orientate might improve or the plasma, plasma leakage sometimes can be maybe ongoing or it might stop. So let's say patient orientate has improved, morning sign has uh, resolved, there's no more plasma leakage. Sometimes you need to slow down the infusion rate or even consider stop, especially if it's going nearing to the end of the 48 hours and entering to recovery phase. If the fluid infusion rate is more than the maintenance requirement, infusion rate should be reviewed within four to six hours. That's why banking dengue patients usually review them clinically. That means review patient clinically and also review the full blood count every four to six hours, especially during the critical phase. And this depends. Sometimes if patients go into composite shock, I mean, you need to review even more frequent, for example, hourly or two hourly, depending on patient's clinical condition, either they improve or they deteriorate. In patients with persistent warning signs with increasing or persistently high hematocrit, the greater fluid bolus may be initiated with caution. So what is the greater fluid bolus regime? I'm sure all of you know that it's a 5-3-2 regime. So first, we have to obtain baseline hematocrit before the fluid therapy. And always use crystalline solution, crystalloid solution first, such as our 0.9% normal saline. Start with 5 mil per kg per hour for 1 to 2 hours. Then assess. Before that, we have to assess before we reduce to 3 mil per kg per hour or 2 to 4 hours if patient is improving. And then assess again. If patient is improving further, we cut down the fluid further to 2 mil per kg per hour. Or even less. Sometimes we cannot. We sometimes we need to cut down even faster. It depends on clinical response. And sometimes we cannot. We cannot uh, really cut down to, from five to three to two if patient is not improving. So this is a rough guide if we want to give, give a grade, graded fluid bolus regime. But it all depends on our reassessment and patient's clinical condition. If the club clinical parameters are worsening and hematocrit is rising increase the rate of infusion. So increase instead of reduce, if everything is worsening. But if it, it is improving, then you can safely give the five, then three, then two meals per kg per hour, greater bonus. So the most important, the keyword should be here, reassess. We must always reassess, reassess, and reassess patient. Reassess the clinical status, repeat the blood, the hematocrit, okay? And you can repeat some other blood like your BBG, your several lactate huh? that can help you and guide you in your fleet management and review the fleet infusion rate accordingly. The next, when we give fleet, it is important to monitor urine output. Why? Because it reflects the renal blood flow and hence reflects the intramuscular volume. In early shock, kidneys conserve fluids by reducing urine volume. And in severe shock, there is no urine that will be produced. So it's an uh, anuria stage. So a uh, monitoring urine output is important to know whether we are giving enough fluid or not, whether the intravascular volume is enough or not. So how much fluid or how much urine output we need to monitor? 
in outpatient, we can ask patient whether they are urinating four to six times a day or not. If they are urinating four to six times a day, that means patient is drinking enough. In inpatient, uh, in inpatient, we can monitor their urine output by asking them to chart down uh, their, their urine output, uh, strict urine, uh, strict in, input and output charting. And we can calculate whether it's more than 0 0.5 mu per kg per hour or not. So we must always ensure that the urine output of our inpatient must be at least more than 0 0.5 mu per kg per hour. Less than that is an indication that patient is in shock. But there's a pitfall in this. That means we cannot just take urine output as our sole indicator of whether our intravascular volume is, is adequate or not. Because in hyperglycemia or uncontrolled diabetes, there is an inappropriately large volumes of urine is produced. We call it this polyuria in diabetes. So um, we might be fooled into thinking that patient is passing enough urine when in actual fact, patient is still in shock but patient has diabetes. That's why uh, there's in the initial phase, there's still a lot of urine produced. But this glycosuria and polyuria will worsen shock. Okay, when do we reduce our IV drip? We can reduce or discontinue IV drip when patients begin to show signs of recovery. So all these are the signs of recovery. What are the signs of re recovery? Okay, so uh, before we talk about size of recovery, we can we must uh, be aware of the hours of defervescence. So usually 24 to 40 hours of defervescence, we need to start to consider to cut down our drip because patient from critical phase is entering to recovery phase. Once they enter recovery phase, there will be reabsorption. So all the plasma leakage, the feed that is leaked out from the vessel, they will be reabsorbed back in the to the vessel and might even cause over, over volume, okay, overload. That's why when a patient is, uh, is, is at, uh, going out of critical phase and entering recovery phase, we need to reduce strength. Okay, size of recovery. Hematocrit drop in stable patient. That means when we monitor the full blood count, we are seeing a drop in the hematocrit. And at the same time, patient is stable hemodynamically. For example, the CRT is good, pulse volume good, pulse pressure good, patient is not tachycardic, BP is stable, and hematocrit is dropping, and patient claim to be, uh, to be feeling better, with better in, uh, appetite, feeling well, with no warning sign. In that case, that those are signs of recovery. So we cannot just take hematocrit drop as sign of recovery. It must be to get a hematocrit drop in a improving or stable patient. For example, improving appetite. Resolution of warning signs, good urine output, and stable hemodynamic. So this is a conclusion of our recommendation. So conclusion number one, patient should be encouraged to take orally. If patient can take orally. If cannot take orally, we need to start IV drip. For example, if they are vomiting and cannot take orally, or if they can take orally, but there's still ongoing plasma leakage and hematocrit is still increasing. That means their oral intake, they cannot depend on oral intake only. And hence, we have to help them with IV fluid maintenance. So in patients with persistent warning sign, with persistently high hematocrit, we need to start graded fluid bolus of 5, 3, 2 mil per kg per hour ranging. And most important, crystalloid solution should always be the fluid of choice for non-shock dengue patients. Remember, crystalloid here. Yeah? So we go into a few case discussion. This is the first case. This is the history. This is a 26-year-old lady. She came with fever for six days with nausea, vomiting, and myalgia. On day five of fever, she went to PK, Clinic Kasiatan. ABC there was, total white was 1.6, HP is 13.1, hematocrit 38.9, platelet 99. So what did the doctor do? The doctor did a dengue combo kit, dengue test, okay? The dengue combo kit, IgM, came back positive. So the doctor advised her to Take, take enough fluid huh? and to return the next day for the account. So, uh, but patient came today, okay? Came again today on day six. Came with nausea, myalgia, and with severe vomiting all six times a day. Diarrhea two times with mild abdominal pain, but there's no bleeding tendency so far. So these are the parameters 
on day 6 of fever. On examination, clinically, the weight is 40 kilo. As I mentioned, uh, weight is always very important in dengue patient. You need to measure. Okay, then the vital sign. Temperature, 37.3. Heart rate, 100. BP, 102.69. So this is a bit lowish, but it can be common or normal for people with low baseline blood pressure, especially in young, thin females. And also, uh, young, okay, usually young, thin females. Sometimes can be elderly. So respiratory rate 16, he's uh, not tachypnic. Okay. Always check the peripheries. The warm, the weather is a warm or cold. Whether how, how is the pulse volume? How is the CRT? So all these are very important. Not, uh, not just our warning signs. So we have to go by symptoms, the signs, and the clinical fi finding in the patient, clinical examination of the patient. And then lastly, laboratory and also imaging results. So this patient has warm periphery, SQ2 99% under room S, CRT less than 2 seconds, and GCS is full fee of 50 over 15. So these are the blood parameters. Day 5, when she was told to go back, uh, these are, the HP was 13, H1 took hematocrit 38, that 99. But on day 6, there is a jump increase in hematocrit and a concurrent drop in platelet from 99 to 28. So as you can see here, it has been highlighted, patient now is Heart rate is tachycardic, borderline, okay? If it's more than 100, it's tachycardic. So 100 actually we take as considered tachycardic already. And uh, hematocrit increase and there's low blood. Other than that, all this look pretty fine. So what is the current diagnosis? From the symptoms, you can see patient has severe vomiting more than six times per day and abdominal pain. So these are warning signs. And from here, these are the blood parameter and the the side and also patient clinical examination. So what, what is the diagnosis? Is it dengue infection in critical phase with warning side or is it a severe dengue infection in compensated shock with severe plasma leakage or dengue fever with gastritis? Okay, so let us decide. Does this patient have warning sign? Look at all this. Yes, patient has abdominal pain and tenderness persistent vomiting and diarrhea. This patient has six times vomiting, so it's more than three times per 24 hour. Does she have third space fluid accumulation, such as cystitis, fluid infusion, pericardial infusion? In this case, it's not uh, mentioned, and but there's a patient is not tachypnic, so I assume there's no SpO2 as well. So there is most likely there's no fluid infusion. And uh, it's mentioned there's no bleeding tendency. GCS is full, so patient doesn't have metagy and doesn't attend the liver. So there is a Raise hematocrit with rapid drop. So in this case, she has warning signs, three warning signs. Right? So what is the fluid management? As you look at this slide, what do you think? How should you manage her? Should you encourage oral fluid and start anti -hematic? Okay, you can take two to three liters per day. I'll give you uh, IV Maxolon. Or should you maintain, start a full maintenance drip of 60 cc per hour, according to weight. Huh? And or you should you give a graded bolus or should you resuscitate immediately with colloid 10 to 20 mil kg? So which should you give? So the answer is here. A rising hematocrit indicates ongoing plasma leakage despite oral fluid intake and will require an increase in the IV fluid infusion rate. Hence the graded fluid bolus therapy. So this one we mentioned just now. Okay how to give the graded fluid bolus therapy. Start with 5 meals per kg per hour for 1 to 2 hours, then reduce 3 meals and then 2 meals, depending on clinical response. So we can give graded fluid bolus. How to calculate? Take 40 kg. Okay, 40 kg. But most of um, we need to calculate. Remember, always calculate the BMI. Let's say the BMI is less than 27.5 uh, kilo, kg per meter square, then you can just use this formula. Okay, 40 kg times 5 mil uh, per hour for 2 hours. So 40 times 5 is 200. 200 mils per hour for 2 hours. Okay, And then you reassess. If it's improving, then you give 40 kg times 3 mils. This 3 mils per kilo per hour. And give for another 2 hours. Then reassess again. Review patient and also blood result. Don't just review blood result without it reviewing patient. So we have to review both. Patient and blood result. So we can review the FPC, VPG, and lactate. 
Okay, in this patient, on day 7 of illness, patient entered into critical phase 22 hours at 8 a.m. So remember, we have, always have to calculate the hour of the person. Okay, noted patient did not pass during the whole night from 12 midnight to morning. Urea output charted as new, means anuria. Okay, and there's a positive balance of 1,230 uh, cc. Patient is getting more lethargy. So this is it's a very dangerous, it is a dangerous sign. Okay, because most of the time patient will still be lucid or conscious. Okay, as the, the CNS perfusion usually will be maintained uh, before, uh, that means all the other non-vital organ will be affected first before the CNS. If the CNS is affected already, it means that it's already, uh, it's already very, it's already into a late, late stage. At 7 a.m., patient went to the toilet and felt very weak, almost fell down. She was brought back to bedside and nurses attended to her immediately. So this very big can be due to a CNS involvement, very lethargy, or it can be due to and fell down because it can be due to pre-syncope or postural hypotension. It means there is a drop in the blood pressure. So why did she have um, that's why did she feel weak and almost fell down? There is a drop in blood pressure. And the nurse took the to the vital sign, the blood pressure was 80 over 40. Okay. Immediately, patient was being assessed. She has cold periphery. Here, pulse was fever and cannot get. Uh, they have to take manual BP, eh? the dynamic BP of, of 80 over 40, heart rate of 120. Still alert, but at CRT, three seconds. There's a presence of shitting downers, which indicates ascites, but at that point, lungs were still clear. So, what is happening? This is a case of severe dengue. So this is a late stage, huh? late stage of decompensated dengue shock syndrome. And patient is in critical phase, 22 hours into the person. So in dengue shock syndrome, how should we manage? All cases of dengue shock syndrome should be managed in the ICU. So fleet resuscitation should be prompt, must be fast, okay? And also must be, there must always be uh, two large four branula at least for red fleet resuscitation. Okay, and pay attention because following initial resuscitation, there may be recurrent episodes of shock because capillary leakage can continue for 24 up to 48 hours. So we need to stay close with patient, continue frequent monitoring and continue close monitoring, not just clinically, but laboratory and imaging, imaging to we do our ultrasound to look at our IVC, our pure efficient to ascites to, to look at the fluid responsiveness to therapy. So these are the hemo hemodynamic changes in compensated shock. We look at the blood pressure and heart rate. So as you can see, as time progresses, the patient is going to uh, patients in uh, going to uh, worsening shock uh, in compensated shock. Systolic blood pressure, you see, as you can see, systolic pressure is almost at 120. That later on only drop, but you can see there is a greater increased rise in diastolic blood pressure. This is all because of peripheral vessel constriction and increase in peripheral vascular resistance. So when there is a peripheral vessel constriction to maintain blood supply to the to the vital organs and also non vital organs, there will be an increase in diastolic pressure and has reduction of the pulse pressure. You see, there's a narrowing of pulse pressure between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. You can see that it's a, it's a narrow, narrowing, okay? Okay, so you can see uh, that systolic blood pressure remain elevated, but there's a rising diastolic pressure and narrow pulse pressure. What happened to the pulse? Pulse will be, the volume will become lower, weaker, and the heart rate slowly increase become diacardic. So there's a reduced peripheral perfusion. Okay, because of what? Well, peripheral vessel constriction. Okay, there's the, the blood supply to the not so vital organ, for example, the skin will reduce. Okay, and then you can get cool and cold peripheries and pure extremities. Prolonged CRT, okay? Usually normal CRT will be less than two seconds. In this case, CRT can be two seconds or even more. 
okay, because there's a reduced peripheral perfusion to the non-vital organ, for example, skin, and later on, kidney. So there will be kidney shutdown, there will be oliguria, and also anguria. And then later on, only reduced perfusion to the, to the heart and to the brain. But initially, the brain is still functioning because it's the last organ that will be affected. So GCS, most of the time, will be full, full still, okay? See, lucid conscious level, especially in young adult and children. So there will be lucid the conscious level, but that doesn't mean they are not in shock because other signs are showing that patients are in shock, okay? Decreased urine output. And what is quiet tachypnea? Patient is tachypneic. You can notice that he's breathing fast, but he has no other signs of respiratory distress. SpO2 might be still okay, okay? But there is a quiet tachypnea and this is because of metabolic acidosis, okay? Especially in the cases where there's a reduced perfusion to the organ causing metabolic acidosis, okay? In the cases of patient coming with warning sign epigastric pain, okay, abdominal pain, epigastric tenderness, is also because of reduced perfusion. Okay, so now we go into, I believe this uh, table is a very common table uh -huh. in the CPG that you can see every dengue update. So this is a parameter of stable circulation and these are parameters of compensated shock. So it's very important to detect patient in compensator shock because this stage is a stage where you can do something about it before patient go into decompensator shock and it's most of the time irreversible and hard to save the patient. So at this point of time, it's a window of opportunity for all the doctors that to save the patient. Okay, Cautious level, as I mentioned, it will still be clear, GCS will still be full okay, and it will be lucid. However, please go check the peripheries of the patient. Always look at the, the color, okay, the capillary refill time, which prolonged more than two seconds, the temperature, full peripheries, the pulse volume, weak and thready, heart rate, tai It's always it's always the best huh, optimum to take a manual heart rate. Okay, blood pressure, okay, there's a normal systolic pressure, but rising diastolic pressure. So remember the shock index we mentioned we mentioned. Huh? Ah, so uh, you see the the, the the pulse, the pulse uh, rate is coming up uh, to be a normal systolic pressure and there's rising diastolic pressure. So pulse pressure is very important to monitor. So what normal should be 40 to 60. So it, it's getting narrow, narrower and narrower that you have to watch out that patient is in shock. Okay, And also postural hypotension. If patient has signs of postural hypotension like giddiness or uh, pre-syncope where she stand up uh, from sitting position, there's a sign of Postural hypotension. Also look at, monitor the, the respiratory rate because patient might have quiet arcania and monitor urine output. So if you, we need to always monitor all these parameters to detect the stage of composite shock. It's important because they are reversible. All these are reversible. So remember this, eh? the, the periphery, CCTVR, we call it CCTVR, okay? Color and our temperature, volume, okay? and your uh, CRT. Okay, next, we miss this, this stage, compensator composite shock, we miss all the signs of compensator shock this stage, we will go into hypotensive shock, which is the decompensated shock period. And this time, stage, and this stage, in this stage, usually is uh, harder to save the patient as compared to compensator shock. So in this case, patient will the CNS will be in, in, uh, affected, the central nervous system. Okay, so patient will become restless. Okay, CRT, of course, will be prolonged. Patient uh, peripher uh, periphery will be cold. Pulse will be very weak. Patient has severe tachycardia or in late stage of shock, even uh, bradycardia. So BP will be low. And look at this. When the pulse pressure is less than 20, then it is already in decompensated shock. Patient have Kuzma, Rene, patient have Oliguria or Anuria. So in this case, it's, prognosis is bad. So key clinical signs of deterioration. So look at the mental state. Huh? So mental state, if you, if you see there's changes, you know that already patient is in a late stage of shock, really the decompensated stage. Okay, patient, these are the signs. Patient can be confused, restless, confused, extremely lethargic. 
So sometimes you say this patient doesn't really want to talk to you when she ask question, when you ask question. Then you think that this patient is very manja, but actually this patient might be very lethargy. So that until until the extent that he or she cannot answer question, it's not not an attention seeking behavior. Huh? So the patient is just purely lethargy. Or seizure can happen, or agitation alternating with drowsiness. Okay, this is a warning. Huh? Yet some children and young adults continue to have clear mental state. So usually all these signs of deterioration you can see more often in elderly patients, but in young children and adults, you must be careful, very careful because they can always have clear mental state that appear to you as stable, but actually their CRT is already three seconds, their blood pressure is low already, but they are still, they are still, uh, the diseases are still full, they can still be, still be sitting up down and talking to you, but at the same time, they might be experiencing shock already. So fleet management in compensated shock. So in con on compensated shock, fleet resuscitation is the 5 to 10 mil per kg per hour over 1 hour after you finish this polis, check or any improvement or not, reassess patient. If there is, then you can cut down your breath. So what do you mean by there is clinical response, positive clinical response? So these are the criteria. We look at clinical response and laboratory response. So clinical response is improvement in general well-being or mental state, warm periphery CRT improving from maybe from 3 seconds to 2.5 seconds to 2.5 seconds to 2 seconds or 2 seconds to less than 2 seconds. Blood pressure stable, improving pulse pressure, reducing tachycardia, improving urine output, and less acute Always monitor respiratory rate. And not just monitor clinical, we also have to monitor by the full blood count. That's why we need to send our FBC stat. Okay, we need to trace fast, send fast. Huh? And also look at the hematocrit, that is appropriate decrease or not. Not just the FBC, we need other blood for as a guide, but MBC is the basic one. We need to we need our VBG to tell us whether there's a improvement in metabolic acidosis or not, and also serolactate whether it's getting lower or not. Lower the better, okay? Okay. So if patient doesn't improve from all these criteria, okay, patient still is still lethargy, just is not improving, periphery still cold. Okay, check hematocrit. Okay. Okay. So this is what you do when patient is improving after the initial 5 to 10 new per kg per hour resuscitation. Okay, let's say you give 10 and patient is improving. Okay, then you can reduce to, to what? To 5 to 7 meals per kg per hour crystalloid. Okay, and then check again. If after 1 hour or 2 hour you check, if it's improving, you can reduce the infusion rate to, three, to 5 meals per kg per hour for 2 to 4 hours. And then reduce again to 2 to 3 meals per kg per hour. Okay, you continue to re improve, you can reduce the fit, uh, fit infusion rate and just give a maintenance, okay, a normal maintenance. Or and then uh, continue to monitor 4 to 6 hourly. Okay, let's say patient is not stable. Okay, that means we go back to this slide. Improvement, no, no improvement. Patient doesn't improve with, doesn't improve or is not stable. We look at the hematocrit. If the hematocrit is increasing, that means what? That means patient is still having plasma, ongoing plasma leakage, continuous con plasma leakage. So we need to consider bolus fluid administration again, another round of bolus, and increase fluid administration, uh, increase the infusion rate. If the hematocrit is decreasing, and patient is still not stable, patient clinical condition is still not improving, deteriorating, and the hematocrit is also reducing. Don't think that patient is safe. This is a sign of a cow bleeding. So consider transmission with packed red cells or blood components. Okay, so continue to monitor. So this 48 hours is the critical time, okay, whether to, to save your patient, whether that can help to determine whether this is a good prognosis or a bad prognosis for your patient. So, 48 hours, sometimes the doctors really have to stay beside the patient and, and monitor closely. But when patient is approaching 48 hours, we can consider to reduce our infusion, you know, our fit infusion rate and uh, 
even consider to stop it. Huh? Cause patient, after 58 hours of defensive, patient enter into recovery phase. And that is the time when we can say, phew, okay? So this is what I mentioned already, okay? Okay, how about in decompensated shock? We saw, huh? Decompensated shock, all the size, okay? And the blood pressure will be low. So, uh, in decompensated shock, it can give, we need to give uh, 20 mils per kg. And must be, in this case, uh, previous, in previous cases, we can give crystalloid, but in this case, we can give colloid or crystalloid. And must be fast, 15 or 2, 30 minutes. We can give it fast. Okay, all these are very important now. Uh, all okay, of the bloods, uh, the blood car, PRBS, coagulation profile, lactate, VBG, yeah? check them level before fluid resuscitation. Okay, so we give fast, uh, bolus 15 to 30 minutes, uh, pump in the blood straight. Uh, pump, in, pump in the fluid straight, fluid, sorry. Okay, if there is improvement judged by all these criteria, clinical response, laboratory response, then we can reduce our infusion rate. Okay, like you should reduce. Okay, for 20 mils, can reduce to 10 mils kg hour, then 7, 5, 3, 2, okay? But if there is no improvement after the first 20 mils kg per hour of resuscitation, then what should we do? We look at the hematocrit again. If the hematocrit is increasing trend or it's still high, give another second bolus of fluid colloid, 10 to 20 mils per kg over half an hour to one hour. And if hematocrit is reducing, consider occult bleeding. That means bleeding that you cannot see inside the body. And don't wait for bleeding that you can, don't wait to see bleeding. Huh? You, before that happens, you have to quickly initiate transfusion with packed red cells. Okay. Okay. After adequate fleet resuscitation, okay, judged by the amount of fit you gave, uh, the image, okay and uh, your calculation and all, but patient is still in shock, then we cannot just keep on giving free, giving blood. We have to always consider other causes of shock, why blood pressure is still low. So there are different causes of shock in dengue fever and not just our hypovolemic shock. So other causes, huh? at the same time, septic shock, or patient could, have, could be having Bleeding and leaking at the same time. So this is very tricky. When patient leak, the hematocrit go up. But when patient bleed at the same time, hematocrit go down. So the hematocrit may remain the same. But blood pressure is still low. Okay, at the same time, patient might have cardiac dysfunction. For example, in dengue myocarditis. So the heart cannot pump, pump well and hence reduce the cardiac output, reduce the blood circulation, reduce blood pressure. Okay, so certain cases of severe metabolic acidosis with hyperlactatemia, for example, in liver and multi organ failure, also can lead to shock. Last one more is cytokine storm. So we must always have these five causes at the back of our mind to know that there are other causes of shock and to consider our inotropes early. Okay, inotropes. Okay, and not just fluid. Choice of fluid in dengue shock syndrome. So IV fluid therapy is the mainstay of treatment for dengue shock. There is no clear advantage of using any of the colloids over crystalloid in terms of the overall outcome and mortality. However, colloid may be preferable as a fluid of choice in patients with intractable shock in the initial resuscitation. For example, in our decompensated shock syndrome. The choice of colloids include gelatin solution and alchemy. Hydroxyethyl starch solution, HES, should not be used as it was associated with an increase in the rate of renal replacement therapy and coagulation abnormalities. Colloid should be used mainly for resuscitation, but shouldn't be used for long. That means cannot be have, we, can, we, we cannot keep on infusing colloid only and not change the into crystalloid or alter, alternate the, I mean, to reduce the infusion rate and change the crystalloid. So prolonged use of colloid as so montanus bleed should be avoided. This is a study, SAFE, S-A-F-E study, uh, comparing colloid albumin versus crystalloid normal saline. So in this study, uh, 
6,997 patients underwent randomization. So 3,497 patients were given albumin and 3,500 patients were give, given normal saline during their fluid resuscitation. So the conclusion from this study yeah, in the dengue, in dengue fever patient who received either albumin or normal saline, the conclusion here is use of either 4% albumin or normal saline for fluid resuscitation results in similar outcomes at 28 days. So it says that there is no difference between crystalloid or colon. Okay, this is a very important topic. We all must always suspect significant account bleeding because blood transfusion in time can save patient life. So when do you suspect account bleeding? Because you cannot see any bleeding. Uh, you, at the point, patient might not have any uh, upper dry bleed or mucosal bleeding. Okay, but the patient is hemodynamically uh, unstable and all these are the signs, okay? that we need to suspect a cup bleeding. First, hematocrit not as high as expected for the degree of shock to be explained by the plasma leakage alone. Second, a drop in hematocrit without clinical improvement despite adequate fluid replacement. How much? 40 to 60 mL per kg. So just now when I say adequate fluid replacement, you have the calculation, huh? piece of calculation for it, and also have to judge by uh, you can use but your imaging technique to help to judge like your, your ultrasound. Okay? Next, severe metabolic acidosis and end organ dysfunction despite adequate fluid replacement. That means we keep on infusing fluid, but patient with BG is still not improving, in fact, worsening. The lactate is still increasing. Okay, and there, there are signs of other end organ dysfunction that show that the patient might be having a cow bleeding. Okay, in all cases, in all cases, there is no role for prophylactic transfusion of platelet, despite if the platelet is very low, single digit of the platelet could be just one or two, but there is no role of prophylactic transfusion of platelet or FFP. So early detection of bleeding is essential. So hence, in all cases, we need to have, always have high index of suspicion. Don't wait until too late, okay? It's, uh, it's as you good to, to transfuse uh, when we have any suspicion, uh, the slight, slightest suspicion of, of a cow bleeding. So back red cell transmission is required for significant bleeding. As for persistent or significant upper GI bleeding, okay, there's a, uh, there's, a there's a recommendation to do endoscopy. So we need to involve our uh, surgical colleagues. Okay, and it becomes a multidisciplinary uh, approach. Okay, so this is uh, a conclusion uh, in our CBG guideline, the recommendation. Crystalloid solution should be the preferred choice. Okay, a patient with Dengue shock syndrome who do not respond to initial crystalloid resuscitation, then you should give patient colloid. In dengue shock syndrome with persistent shock, always consider the other causes of shock, the five causes of shock, okay, and should be treated accordingly. Okay, uh, those uh, were the slides on fluid management in dengue fever. So uh, now I talk a little bit about chikungunya since it has been in our country and it has affected us also. So uh, just a little bit of information about chikungunya. Okay, comparison here, chikungunya and dengue. So both, in both cases, there'll be fever, but look at the rash. In chikungunya, rash appear early, day four, one to four. Our dengue, the rash appear later on, okay, day five to seven, and there's a petechia rash. So remember, it's a non-blanchable petechia rash happens, okay, due to can be due to bit thrombocytopenia, okay, it can be due to bleeding tendency, okay, but but uh particular rash don't confuse it with the convalescent rash uh, during the recovery phase. So retroorbital pain common in dengue by rare in chikungunya, atralgia constant in chikungunya but rare in dengue. In dengue you can get myalgia atralgia, but it's constant uh, most of the time. Eh? That means in chikungunya is all the time you have atralgia, okay. Myalgia in both cases, arthritis, not this. Chikungunya patient will have arthritis and it's common. However, it's absent in dengue. So you can have arthritis in dengue, but no arthritis. Okay, so it's different. Arthritis is just a joint pain, arthritis in the shoulder joint. Tenosinovitis is also absent in dengue, but common in chikungunya. So in chikungunya patient will have arthritis and tenosinovitis. And sometimes this might, this might uh, persist even after the infection has resolved. Some people persist for many, many, many years after the infection. 
So hypertension is possible in chikungunya. Okay, not, not so common, but uh, in dengue is common. Minor bleeding in French, chikungunya and dengue is common huh? in our dengue hemorrhagic fever. So thrombocytopenia uh, can happen in chikungunya early and it should occur in early phase and it's mild. Dengue occur later and uh, it's moderate to severe. Chikungunya is transmitted by bites of any mosquito. So diagnosis is by RT-PCR test. Uh, good news is it's not a life-threatening infection. However, it can cause a uh, prolonged irritating uh, arthritis uh, and joint pain uh, even uh, after the infection is resolved. So usually we advocate symptomatic treatment for mitigating pain and fever using anti-inflammatory drug along with the rest. So for this, uh, for this disease, uh, adequate fluid intake or IV fluid is, uh, is important. So uh, my take-home message today is maintenance of the body, patient's body fluid volume is critical in severe maybe care. And uh, heterogeneity of shock means there are different types of shock huh? that make uh, different types of shock okay, in dengue, dengue fever. So the different causes of shock means that one recommendation doesn't suit all. So conclusion is we have to always assess patient because every individual patient is different. Thank you.